Chapter 2 A Wonderful Meeting So being in a state of spiritual ecstasy and intoxicated by the contemplation of the beauties of God, spilled by a generous hand across the face of the desert, we turned our attention down and were surprised to notice a man walking in the distance with a large knapsack over his shoulders. His slow and labored steps, with his head bowed, he descended along the mountain slope into a deep, burnt basin. Sometimes it was completely visible, emerging on the tops of the hills. Sometimes it completely disappeared, plunging into the abysses and lowlands between the hills. Then it appeared again and moved towards us. It was amazing and at the same time very touching to see a person in these spaces of a deserted country here, as we know, except perhaps a hunter, and then not as time there are ever people. Looking closer, we noticed that it was a man belonging to our monastic order, and we were very happy, hoping to learn from him a lot of useful things about our desert life. When he was not far from us, we greeted him with the usual greetings among monks. Bless, Father. God bless, came a sincere and brotherly reply. Peace, sit down with us, we said. By the way, our tea is ready. About, that's good, answered the stranger, but I'm so tired that I'm barely alive. Where is God talking, he asked. Yes, I went to the monastery, uh, Zelenchukski, for my spiritual needs, and now I'm going to my desert. And then the hermit who came, completely exhausted, fell to the ground, took off his hat and lay down, stretching out on the ground at his full length, and resting his head on his bags, as all hermits do in general. We looked at him. He was an old man of advanced years. Sweat poured down his face like streams in the spring, and he was all wet and covered with dust. Then he wiped his face with his hand and glorified God, making a prayer and thanks to the Lord God, saying, Glory to thee, God, glory to thee, God, glory to thee, God. Are you tired, Father? we asked. Yes, I was very tired. I walked all day, but the heat was unbearable and there was no water. Well, how far is your desert from here? Well, yes, perhaps we need to go for three days near Aksibai on the Black River. Are there many of you there? There are a lot of hermits there. After lying down for a while, the old man stood up, and we again saw closer and more clearly that he was a tall man with a dry body like the skeleton of a dead man. His long and gray beard reached to his waist. The hair of his head was completely white, like snow on the mountains, and fell to his shoulders, and there was a bald spot in the middle of his head. The cassock, all worn out, was covered with patches and gave off the smell of suffocating sweat. His face showed a look of extreme exhaustion, sunken cheeks and withered lips. But despite all this, the stamp of spiritual sanctification apparently lay on him. The old man's eyes shed inexplicable pleasure and shone with kindness, sincerity, and cordial goodwill. His whole appearance inspired involuntary respect and called for frankness. The elder moved a wooden block of wood lying nearby to the fire and sat on it, warming himself. We read a prayer, and the elder blessed us with the rite of monastic habit. They started drinking tea with crackers. At this time, that wonderful conversation began between us, which entered deeply in my heart. As usually happens to us from hearing about great, wondrous, and highly desired objects, I asked the elder, How long have you been living in the desert? The tenth year is already ending. Where did you live before? I lived in a monastery for twenty years. In which? And then I wholeheartedly and joyfully, with all my zeal, turned to the elder and began to ask him various questions regarding spiritual life. Well, brother, for the sake of the Lord, tell me what is the best thing you brought in the desert. The old man's face lit up and spiritual light shone in his eyes. He was simple in nature, and for this reason the Spirit of God was in him. It was clear that with this question the elder received a blow to the very center of his inner life, and his entire spiritual nature came into motion. And in truth, as we learned later from his conversation, that if someone has united his heart with the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, or what is the same in monastic language has acquired the Jesus prayer, then any reminder of it brings his soul into spiritual delight. The elder answered, I have acquired the Lord Jesus Christ in my heart, and in him without a doubt eternal life which is tangibly and truly heard in my heart, just as it is written about this in the Holy Gospel, in him was life, and life was light of man. 
John 1, 4. Also in many other places of Holy Scripture, this most joyful truth is proclaimed. For example, having the Son of God, of course, in your heart you have life, and not having the Son of God, you do not have life. 1 John 5, 12. And the Lord himself says about himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. Also, I am the resurrection and the life. John 11:25. Having heard such unexpected and amazing words, we were very surprised that we found exactly what we were looking for. They moved closer to the altar, sharpened their hearing, and fixed all their attention on his face, and they themselves turned into spiritual interest with their being, according to the word of the Holy Scripture, Widen your mouth, and I will do it, uh, Psalm 8, 80, 11, and our questions. How, I asked hastily, the elder answered, through unceasing prayer to our Lord Jesus Christ, usually called the monastic prayer, Jesus, which I performed according to the teachings of our Father for many years, according to the commandment given to me in my youth by the great Father and teacher of piety, when I, leaving the world, went to the monastery to lead a monastic life, of course. At the same time, I tried to the best of my ability to remain in fulfillment of all the other commandments of the Lord especially in three of their chapters, love, humility, and chastity, without which, according to the words of the Apostle, no one will see the Lord, Hebrews 12.4. How, we continued to ask with even greater and growing interest. For almost fifteen years, said the elder, I was exclusively engaged in the pronunciation of oral prayer, living at the time in a monastery and doing various tasks entrusted to me out of obedience. During this exercise, I remember I did not pay attention to my mind and heart at all, being content with only one verbal pronunciation of the prayer words, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner which prayer is called oral, verbal, external, bodily, and in the order of prayerful learning and work, as is known, it occupies the lowest primary level. Then, after the designated years had passed, it naturally turned into a mental one, when, that is, the mind began to stay in the words of prayer, seeing the Lord in them, what constitutes, according to the teaching of the Holy Fathers, the second degree of prayer exercise. And prayer here is called mental, mental or simply spiritual. St. John Climacus calls the state of prayer already quite high, praises it because at this level our mind, being by nature scattered, broken, and scattered among the objects and things of this world, gathers itself into itself, and holding on to the words of prayer, remains as if in his own home, alien to all thoughts which generally so painfully tyrannize the soul of every person not renewed by this prayerful grace. This broken state of our mind can be represented by the likeness of a man in a stormy sea. And just as this one, being at the mercy of the waves, does not have the opportunity to stand on a point of immobility, so our mind, not having within itself a fulcrum, Christ is also agitated and overwhelmed by all kinds of movement of thoughts, but this one climbs out of the sea onto a rock and is calm, and this one, having fixed Christ in his heart, according to the expression of the church song, service to St. Basil the Great, holds back his thoughts. And then, by the grace of God, prayer of the heart was revealed, which, according to the teaching of the All-Holy Fathers, constitutes in spiritual life and, in general, in all monastic corrections, the crown, glory, and perfection, because its essence is the closest connection of our heart, or rather the fusion of all of our spiritual being with Lord Jesus Christ, clearly tangible in his most holy name. This sublime and supernatural state, according to the minds of God-wise men, constitutes the last degree and extreme of the aspirations of every rational being created in the image of God and naturally by nature striving for its highest prototype. Here the heartfelt combination with the Lord is formed, in which the Lord pierces our spirit with his presence, like a ray of the sun pierces glass, and this gives us the opportunity to taste the indescribable bliss of holy communion with God. At this degree, according to St. Isaac the Syrian, our spiritual nature reaches the highest degree of its perfection, simplicity, and spirituality, because here is the fullness of spiritual life. 
man enters the region of endless light in which, according to the words of St. Macarius the Great, lives, acts, and is a citizen, and therefore here is the end of all exploits and labors, and we, receiving freedom, abide in God and God in us. This is the divine unity about which the Savior himself speaks, whoever is in me and I in him produce much fruit. John 15, 5. Just as the rod cannot produce fruit for itself and let unless it is on the vine, so also unless you abide in me. John 15, 4. Chapter 3. God himself is present in the name of God. Astounded more and more by the unusually elevated and fascinating conversation which we had never heard from anyone in our entire lives, we were filled with fear and continued to ask with even more growing interest, Explain to us in detail, because this speech is not clear to us. The elder continued, First of all, you need to affirm in yourself that immutable truth, consistent with both divine revelation and sound concepts of reason, that in the name of God, God himself is present, with all his being and all his infinite properties. Of course, this must be understood spiritually with an enlightened heart, and not with that carnal mind, which, illegally invading the spiritual realm, one to physically touch spiritual objects, and not understanding, objects, how can this one give us his flesh to eat, John 6.52, or he still objects in his complete misunderstanding of the matter, how can an old man a second time enter his mother's womb and be born, John 3.4, the Lord says those born of the Spirit are spirit, John 3.6, that is, spiritual objects are understood spiritually in the light of their grace-filled illumination nation. For every faithful worker of Christ who loves his Master and Lord, who earnestly prays to him and bears his holy name reverently and kindly in his heart, his all-giving, venerable, and all-powerful name is as if he himself is the Almighty Lord God and dearest Redeemer of our Lord Jesus Christ, born before all ages from the Father, consubstantial with him, and equal to him in everything. It cannot be otherwise. The Lord is a mental, spiritual, contemplative being and so is his name. In the same way, our souls are spiritual mental beings. Only the distance between them and God is infinite, as it should be between God and creation. For all that, our relationship and approach to him acts spiritually, invisible to bodily eyes, by the internal forces of the soul. In a word, everything happens in the realm of the spirit, where anything corporeal has no place at all. And so, from the point of view, everyone can see that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ cannot be separated from his most holy person. This knowledge, and even more so the feeling of this highest sacrament, is so precious in our spiritual life that it serves as its center and foundation, and that is why they speak about him with such persistent strength and conviction. This divine feeling gives our prayer to the Son of God strength and un interruptedness. It gathers together in the heart all our inner strengths and penetrates with its existence our entire spiritual nature in its collected unity of its forces, like a sunbeam penetrates glass, and our soul, illumined by God's light, pouring out abundantly from the Lord Jesus, who exists in his divine name, already as if naturally and not difficultly, ascends to the degree of the highest spiritual perfection, and in every way a person is spiritual sanctified and united with God. In action this happens like this. When a person moved by the divine beckoning without laziness, with all the diligence that depends on him, without sparing labor and time, in every activity, day and night, calls on the name of God with his mind or lips, with the sacred Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, of course fulfilling at the same time, to the best of his ability, all the other gospel commandments, being in deep self-abasement and awareness of his sinful state and the need for for God's help, then over a large or small time, as it will be pleasing uh, to the knower of the heart, it happens that there is something wonderful and supernatural about him. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ, so to speak, is embodied, as it were. A person clearly feels with the inner feeling of his soul in the name of God the Lord himself. This feeling of the Lord himself and his name merges into an identity by which it is impossible to distinguish one from the other 
Scripture, and this in turn becomes understandable when we think that if the Lord Jesus Christ accepted our nature into his divine personality and is called the God-man by one name because in his flesh dwelt all the fullness of the divinity, Colossians 1.19, then undoubtedly this fullness of his divine perfections also dwells in his most holy name, Jesus Christ. I would say this, if in the flesh I abided visibly, physically, then in his holy name it was invisible, but the spiritually and perceptibility only with my heart or my spirit, and so bringing his name into our hearts, we touch the invisible, we touch him according to the word of St. Macarius the Great, as if to the very nature of Christ, his theanthropic nature, and in this inner deepest heartfelt unity, or as it were the merging of our spirit with the spirit of Christ, that is, by his God-manhood, we are with him according to the testimony of the apostle one spirit 1st Corinthians 6 17 where due to an extremely close union it were merging we inevitably partake of Christ's properties his goodness love peace bliss and so on we tangibly taste that the Lord is good and from this without a doubt we ourselves become in the image of the one who created us good meek gentle humble we carry in our hearts unspeakable love for everyone we feel an eternal life within ourselves and only such a person for the sake of his heartfelt union with the Lord clearly feeling in his spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, his divine presence, himself, without hesitation, can testify before the whole world that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is he himself, the Lord God, that his name is not separate from his most holy being, but is one with him, affirming this is not on consideration of reason, but on the feeling of one's heart, imbued with the Lord's Spirit. This should also include the words of the Apostle, He who believes in the Son of God, has the testimony of himself. 1 John 5.10 That, of course, there is a feeling of the gracious co-presence of the Lord Jesus in the heart, that is, in the temple of the inner man, confidently audible and tacitly felt. In the same way, one who has within himself the inner action of prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus clearly hears in his heart his saving co-abidance, his life, and even, so to speak, his breath. It is precisely this kind of immediate unity with the Lord that the Jesus prayer brings to us. In this name is eternal life according to the co-presence and abiding of the eternal God in him. According to the Holy Fathers, there is no closer unity than that which exists between God and our soul. And this works most closely and most palpably in the inner Jesus prayer, where our mind, as it were, dissolves with the spiritual invisible being of the Lord Jesus Christ. Explaining this, the Moscow Hierarch Philaret writes, Man is not so created that he should be and remain in distinction from God and at a distance from him. If the human soul is the breath from the mouth of God, then what is the closeness between the breath and the breathing one? Such closeness must be between the soul and God. The distinction between man and God is an unnatural state. In the same way, another contemporary great ascetic of faith and piety writes something similar to this as close as your thought is to you as close as faith to your heart so close is God to you, and the closer and firmer the thought about God, the more alive the faith and the knowledge of one's weakness and insignificance and the feeling of need for God, the closer he is or as close the air is to the body and to its entrails, so close is God. For God, so to speak, is the mental air that all the angels, the souls of saints and souls breathe, living people and especially pious ones. You cannot live without God for a minute, and you really live in him every minute. Archpriest John Sergeyev. For in him we live and move and we are. Acts 11.28 When the name of the Lord Jesus dwells in our heart, then this becomes the seat of the divine, a land of light, 
joy and the spiritual feeling of eternal life. St. Macarius the Great says, in the heart, as it were, spiritual abodes open, and when entering them, a person again sees countless others, and there is another and another, and so on without end. We can say that this unity with God is, as it were, a new Eden, similar to the one in which the primordial one lived before the fall, a state of special closeness of man to God, in which we enjoy the sweetness of contemplation. Of course, such closeness to God, of God to man, illuminates our natural powers with abundant gracious light. It enlightens the mind with the knowledge of God's will, puts strength and vigor into the will to fulfill the divine laws, and unites the heart with God with the closest bonds of the sweetest love. This can be explained with another similarity. The Lord Jesus Christ taught, Believe in me, rivers of living water will flow out of his womb. This is said, explains the Apostle, about this whoever wants to receive him in his name. Uh, also, in a conversation with the Samaritan woman, the Lord Jesus explained the divine life. The source of him is in him alone, by the image of water flowing into an eternal belly, John 4.10. And this flows into eternal life is love for the Lord Jesus Christ, which having settled in our heart through the fulfillment of his saving commandments and deep humility, moves it with unceasing prayer to the Beloved, like a flowing source that streams of which never dry up. And then one might say, only having this divine love in our hearts do we calmly remain on the waters of rest, having within ourselves sources of living waters flowing into eternal life. And this love or memory of God expressed through prayer necessarily unites our spirit with the Lord into one, in which unity sharing with our spirit his divine nature, we become partakers of eternal life. This alone can quench the insatiable thirst of our spirit with nothing else but calm in its highest aspirations. This is what the Lord expressed in these words, Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him uh, will never thirst. John 4.14 for the dwelling of Christ and his abiding in us is inevitably marked by the divine life, the movements of which, expressed by actions of love, fill our entire soul with the sweetest sensations of the divine, in which our spirit receives complete uh, satisfaction of its eternal and immortal aspirations, and the heart reaches the final edge with all its needs, desires, aspirations. There is nowhere to go further, and there is nothing for it. In God is the purpose of everything that exists. The signs of this high state are mortification to the world and revival of the inner man for spiritual and holy deeds, thirst for eternal blessings. The mind is then elevated above creation, and all the feelings of soul and body are subjugated to it, having completely united itself with God. It remains insensitive to all created being, a blessed and desirable state, which may the Lord God vouchsafe for everyone who is zealous for this to achieve. Chapter 4. But in order to feel, or as it were, touch with the inner feeling of your soul, the deity in the name of Jesus Christ, this is not easy and is not human power, but is the highest gift of God, because then there is real communication of our soul with the Lord and heartfelt unity with him, in which is the goal and the extreme degree of desires of all spiritual and moral beings. Here our soul is, as it were, overwhelmed by the sweet and blissful sensation of the influx of God, and our heart accepts an effective union with Christ the Lord, in whom is eternal life and the kingdom of heaven. It is known that each of us undoubtedly recognizes those moments in which we vividly feel the presence of the divine in ourselves, as belonging to the most sublime moments in our spiritual life. And now the memory of God, or what is the same, the Jesus prayer, gives complete opportunity, if not always to be in this most exalted state, since according to St. Isaac of Syria, there is not a person, even among the saints, who would not undergo changes. Then opportunities to experience and dwell in it often. Jesus Christ is God, therefore he who abides in him abides in God, and God in him. Just as he himself says, whoever does not abide in me will be cast out, but if anyone remains in me and I in him, he will produce much fruit.
John 15, 4 through 6. The Lord himself does not separate his most holy name from his most holy being. And Moses spoke to the Lord, Show me your glory. The Lord answered, I will go before you with my glory and call on my name. The Lord is before you. Exodus 33, 18 through 19. He also says about Saul, For I will tell him how much it is fitting for him to suffer for my name. Acts 19.15-16 He who does not believe is already condemned because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3.13.16-18 and 18. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians 6.11 Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and let those who believe live according to his name. John 20.31 here is an immutable dogma. There are the witnesses in heaven, says St. John the Theologian, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. 1 John 5, 7 through 8. So the Son of God is himself in his prenatural divine being, born before the ages of the Father, equal to him in everything, and consubstantial, and he invariably exists in all the fullness of his divine essence in the Holy Spirit, thanksgiving in Christian churches, and he is in his holy name fully and entirely and abides with all of his perfections and all the fullness of his divinity. This is the most sublime and spiritual knowledge of our divine feeling. Otherwise, spiritual vision and contemplation is accessible by its sensation to the heart of a person who is completely imbued with faith and love for Christ and with uh, his whole soul, with the most sincere and complete disposition in the light of grace-filled illumination our ordinary natural reason should have no place here as by the nature it does not understand the essence of the Spirit of God for it is foolishness but it is not understood spiritually 1 Corinthians 2.14 This divine sacrament visible in the Spirit and accepted by the heart sanctifies our entire inner being enlightens the mind with the radiance of unevening light but the eternal light of Christ the Son of God existing in his most holy Holy divine name, when we reverently carry it within our breast, moves the will through the fulfillment of the will of God to unity with the supreme good, and puts into the feeling of the heart this sweetest feeling of unity with God, which allows us to taste the first fruits of eternal life. According to this concept, the contemporary ascetic of faith and piety, the archpriest father excellently uh, discusses this about the name of the Lord, John Sergio. Here are his words, The name of the Lord, the mother of God, or an angel, or a saint, may it be for you instead of the Lord himself, the mother of God, an angel, and a saint, the closest of your word to your heart. May it be a guarantee, an indication of the closeness to your heart of the Lord God himself, the mother of God, an angel, or saint. The name of the Lord is the Lord himself. The Spirit is everywhere and fills everything. The name of the mother of God is the mother of God herself. The name the name of the angel is the angel. The name of the saint is the saint. How is it? Your name is, for example, name here. If you are called by this name, after all, you recognize yourself fully in it and respond, which means you agree that your name is you yourself with soul and body, and so are the saints calling on their name. You will call on them yourselves, but they have no body, so what of that? The body is only material, the shell of the soul. Its house and man himself is the soul. When you are called by the name, it is not your body that responds, but your soul, through a body bodily organ, and so the name of Almighty God is God himself, the omnipresent and simple spirit. Archpriest John Sergi of My Life in Christ. And besides all this, we can cite as proof of, of such concept of the name of God the opinions of the apostolic husband, Holy Hermas. He says in one of his books, The Son of God, who revealed himself in the last days, but whose name is great and immeasurable and upholds the whole world. You see how he puts the name of God in the place of God himself and ascribes to this name omnipotence, a property 
that inalienably belongs solely to Almighty God. The Holy Fathers, our spiritually dear prayer books, mentors, and leaders, well understood the unlimited power, greatness, and omnipotence of the name of Jesus Christ. Even in the saints, our father Barsanufius the Great spoke as if another, but in essence about himself. We know a person about Christ in these times and in this blessed place living who in the name of his Lord Jesus Christ can perform miracles, no less than the apostles, to heal all kinds of incurable ailments, to open and close heaven, and even to raise the dead, but does not use this power out of humility. And so in order to feel the eternal life within oneself, one must always bear the venerable and all-uplifting name of Jesus Christ in one's mind, lips, and heart, and it will sanctify our entire being. Holy is his name, Luke 149. And where it abides, everything is sanctified. The name Jesus was kept from eternity in the Trinity Council of the Unknown Divinity, even until the day of his appearance in the world, and upon its appearance it perfumed the entire universe and brought peace and blessing to earth. All creation trembles at him as their master, creator, and lord. The demons are horrified and flee. The hellish prisons are shaking. Earthly beings rejoice over him. The angelic nature rejoices. The strongholds of evil and lawlessness are destroyed by him, and holiness, virtue, and pious life shine on earth, because in this name Almighty God abides with all his divine fullness and his endless perfections. And that this is really so can be seen from the Holy Scriptures. In the book of the Wisdom of Solomon it is written, For I keep everyone in silence, and the night of its course is half the way. The omnipotent word, O Lord, and those who descend from heaven, from the throne of the kings, are a cruel scolder in the midst of the uprooting, and the earth is foreknown. The Wisdom of Solomon 18.14-15 and so the most holy name Jesus, brought by Archangel Gabriel to earth as the name of God the Word, was preserved from eternity in the secrets of the Trinity Divinity. In eternity in heaven there is one God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And if the name Jesus was there, then it was God, because nothing created could be there. Even the ranks of angels do not dare to penetrate there. The very cherubim and seraphim closest to the throne of the Lord of hosts hide their faces from the tri-radiant light and the incomprehensible greatness of the divine. There no one saw his face, nor can anyone see, because in the impenetrable light only one God lives there in his tr uh, trinity unity. On what basis will we separate the name of Jesus Christ from his divine nature and not give him honor as God himself and the Son of God? If it eternally dwelt in the unknown depths of the divine ever-being, for the same reason that it is God, the omnipotent power that produces great and glorious deeds belongs to it, even regardless of the holiness of the lives of those people who pronounce it. This, by the way, can be seen from the words of the Lord. Many people People will say to me on the day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name we have cast out demons, and in your name we have done many mighty powers? All who practice iniquity are from me. Matthew 7, 22 through 23. In these words there is new evidence which has all the power of immutable persuasiveness, that in the name of Jesus Christ there is the omnipotent power of God, and therefore this name is God himself. The second thing that is seen in the above words of the Lord Jesus is that his most holy name shows its omnipotent power even when pronounced by wicked people, although on the other hand sometimes the opposite of this happens, as described in chapter 9 of the Acts of the Apostles, and the wandering Jews began to call exorcists over those who have evil spirits, saying the name of the Lord Jesus. We adjure you by Jesus, which Paul preaches, who are the sons of Sceva the Judean, the seventh bishop, who did this. And the evil spirit answered, saying, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? And the man wrote upon them, having the evil spirit in him, and having overcome them, he strengthened himself on them, 
just as he escaped naked and wounded from the temple. Fear came upon them all, and they magnified the name of the Lord Jesus, Acts 19, 13 through 17. Even during the earthly life of the Savior, one day the apostles informed him that they had seen a man casting out demons in his name and for, uh, forbade him because he did not walk with them. The Lord said, Do not forbid. Anyone who has done a power miracle in my name cannot soon curse me. Luke 9.50 In truth, God the Father bestowed this name above all other names on his beloved Son, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Philemon 2.10 from afar, the godfather prophet David saw and uh, proclaimed in song the divine greatness uh, and worldwide glory, incomparable honor of the name of Jesus Christ, exalted above all creation, and how this only name associated with the divine will illuminate in its time with rays of gracious joy the entire universe and fill the earth with the light of God, inexhaustible streams of heavenly grace, and that all ends of the earth will pray on honor his name before them, and pray for him, bless him all day long, his name will be blessed forever. Before the sun his name abides, and in him all the tribes of the earth will be blessed, all the nations will bless him, blessed is the name of his glory forever and ever, the whole earth will be filled with his glory. Psalm 71, 7-9 through nine. Let the kings of the earth and all the people, the princes and all the judges of the earth, young men and two old men and young men, praise the name of the Lord, for the name of him alone is exalted. Psalm 149, 11 and 12. Praise the Lord, fathers, praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from now to eternity, from the east of the sun to the west his name is praised. Psalm 113, 1 through 3. For you have magnified your holy name above all. Psalm 137, 2. But look at the almighty power of the name of Jesus Christ. At the ninth hour it is written in the Acts of the Apostles, Peter and John entered the sanctuary of the hour of prayer, and there was a man lame from his mother's womb asking for alms. They said, We have no silver and gold, but what we have we give to you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk and uh and he and he stood and entered the church walking and jumping praising god acts 3 1 through 8 when the people who flocked in to see this miracle uh they were terribly perplexed. Then St. Peter said to them, uh, Did we do this by our own strength? God the Father glorified his servant Jesus, and by faith in his holy name, this one stands before you healthy. Acts 3, 12 through 16. O oh, the most glorious and beloved name! O oh, the almighty powers hidden in him! The holy apostle Peter, having come to Lydda, finds Aeneas there lying on his bed for eight years, and says to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you, and you are restored to health. Acts 9.34 St. Apostle Paul, when he was cold and turned, spoke to the unclean spirit who lived in the damsel, that he said to people every day, These servants proclaim to us the way of salvation. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And uh, straight away the, it departed, Acts six seventeen through 18 you see the very name of the Lord Jesus Christ contains miraculous power and pronounced with faith produces supernatural works exceeding the laws of nature just as during the, the earthly life of our Lord Jesus Christ this God performed all kinds of miracles with his omnipotent power so after his ascension to heaven those who believe in his name perform no less miracles and now there are as until the end of the age there will be according to the true word of God, true workers of God, who keep the name of God in honor, carry him in their hearts as the greatest shrine, feed on it, enjoy it, and in this name they have a guarantee of the future bliss. The name of Jesus Christ contains everything, our orthodox faith and all church services, every rite, its ritual and order, and all prayerful observance, and every Christian when praying is obliged to always raise his prayer to the only begotten Son of God, who is the one he is an intercessor before God for all men. 
1 Timothy 2, 5, And only to him and through him is our prayer effective. He himself commanded, saying, Whatever you ask from the Father in my name I will do. John 16, 23 through 24. The Lord Jesus Christ contains the entire universe and all creation, visible and invisible, and every breath, and especially brings joy to those who bear this most precious name within their hearts. If we remove the name of Jesus from ourselves, then everything would disappear. The Christian faith, the church, and divine services, all the sacraments and rituals, all the spiritual service, and the gospel itself. This is what we need to understand about a person. If Christ Jesus does not live in him by his grace-filled power, then there is nothing spiritual there. Here, only spiritual and physical life moves according to the elements of this age, because the root and boundlessness uh, of the fullness of the spiritual life is Jesus Christ, whom you need to love more than your soul, and with all your might throughout your life try to install his most dear name in your heart so that it is the root and active principle there, and occupies a dominant position, so that according to the words of the Apostle, we did not live but Christ lived in us. Galatians 2.20 Chapter 5 Question. What is the effectiveness of the Jesus Prayer? What is its inner strength and sensitivity to our heart? Answer. This is the same thing that has already been discussed. That is, to put it differently, when this prayer in all its fullness is established in the soul of a person, first of all, of course, by the grace of God, and then for the sake in this way, long-lasting works, then it becomes an active principle in him, occupies a dominant and predominant position, royally subjugating all other inclinations and heartfelt dispositions. In a word, here it is in its present, as it should be in the correct state state, production, or action. This is an abundant outpouring of grace and joy in God our Savior, evidenced by sincere love for God and neighbor and readiness for every good deed. An expression of this state is the incessancy of inner prayer, when it is no longer limited to time, place, or anything else external, but produces its own invisible action in the depths of the spirit, without words or bows, without any image, form, or reflection, an exalted and blessed state. And this is from the sincere union of the heart with the Lord, when the Lord Jesus Christ makes his abode in us, tangibly and effectively dwells in the heart, and his divine presence is heard clearly and tangibly, which is called in the words of the Holy Father, living communion with God. And then Christ God, being our Redeemer and Savior, descends into man with his grace-filled gifts, unites uh, with him with his divine powers, even to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1, three, and as it were, creates a permanent abode for himself in him, John 14.23, so that man becomes the temple of the Spirit of God, 1 Corinthians 3.16, the living church of God, the abode for himself in him, John 14.23, the Living Church of God, 2 Corinthians 6.16. There is one Spirit with the Lord, 1 Corinthians 6.17. There is a God of love. If he abides in love, God abides, and God abides in him. 1 John 4.16. And the boundaries are God lives. Romans 6.10. And does not live for himself, but God lives in him. Galatians 2.20. Christ is then in man, even as he wills and does. Philippians 2 and 3. A person enters his spiritual state if he understands the ordinary order of affairs. Not suddenly, but at the end of his spiritual exploits and labors, it is the goal of the aspirations of every rationally living monk. Having achieved this, he reached the end of all his labors and exploits. A person being in this state feels within himself the divine power pouring out in the name of Jesus Christ, and being filled with it in the inner feelings of his soul, clearly moves to the spiritual side, and everything earthly becomes subordinate. 
he enters into freedom and rests in God, carries in his heart the source of life, the Lord God himself, and this is the undoubted hope of eternal salvation. Unless having fallen into laziness and carelessness, and having assumed a proud opinion of ourselves, we do not lose this. With an inner prayerful mood, we come under the power of prayer and become its slaves, always praying to the Lord, even if we didn't want to, because we cannot resist the prevailing power of prayer. The Holy Spirit himself prays in us with groanings that cannot be uttered, Romans 8.26, and he also obeys our spirit, for we are children of God, Romans 8.16. We can say that the prayer of Jesus is the spirit of spiritual life. Just like the soul of the body, the body reveals its vitality. When the soul is in it, he becomes dead and insensible when the soul leaves him, and the soul becomes dead when it moves away from God with its consciousness, feeling, and will, and through this it is deprived of the spirit of Christ, divine grace, and the power of God the boundless source of which is the Lord Jesus Christ, the giver of life, and the God, the renewer of human nature. Being in the memory of God, or in the spiritual sensation of the divine with our consciousness and feeling, our soul lives a true life, characteristic of its immaterial nature, because here its entire being is penetrated by God's light, in the same way as the sun's rays penetrate glass, and being in by this uh, divine illumination, she of necessity becomes a participant in the Holy Communion with God, as St. Macarius the Great, cleaving to God with our spirit, he says, or what is the same uniting with him in our spirit, we become with him one spirit, one dissolution, and one mind. Conversations 46 through 8. Such divine closeness to us strikes us with fear, and we would not want to believe this if we were not for this in reality, of which we see evidence everywhere in the writings of the Holy Fathers. Without the communion of this life-giving spirit of Christ, all rational beings, angels and men, must be dead. The Lord says there is a spirit that gives life. The flesh crawls on nothing, even spirit and life, John 6:63, 6, because of emanating from him as the source of ever being, as from self-existent life, they are filled with eternal life, God's power. Then how much more will he himself revive our dead souls when we are by its forces, or what is the same by the spirit through prayer we unite with this divine being? Otherwise, when we voluntarily remove ourselves from the source of living waters, we must naturally stop flowing for us all the streams coming from him, and then our spiritual life must dry up, not having a single life-giving drop for its revival. Without rising to the spiritual realm and not containing in our thoughts and hearts the author of life and the accomplisher of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, we must necessarily be dead in our souls as strangers to the ever-present power of God. God that exists in the Son of God. The Jesus prayer, as it is in its true form, can be likened to this phenomena. If, for example, on the darkest autumn night, when not only there is not a single star in the sky, but even dark thunderclouds filling the air increase, and without the great darkness, suddenly a luminous strip would shine with heavenly brilliance from one end of space to the other, is it possible to imagine the unusualness of this phenomena and its decisive contrast with darkness? So exactly when this most sacred prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shines with divine light in the impenetrable darkness of our souls, or what is the same he himself our Lord, the eternal, non-evening, quiet light of the holy glory of the immortal heavenly Father, the holy blessed Jesus Christ, then possessed by horror we immediately stop in the usual course of our lives, as if struck by the appearance of light from the spiritual world, we recognize its hidden existence from us, of which a single spark, appearing to our gaze, nevertheless showed evidence of endless light and incorruptible blessings located in the insubstantial world existing beyond our bodily senses and from this small phenomenon uh, concluding about the incomparable superiority of the invisible world over everything that is great glorious desirable and beautiful when comparing both 
we distract our hearts from the earthly things and want to diligently remain in God's affairs so that those involved be a spiritual state, giving us the opportunity to experience the beginnings of a higher being, and therefore the intention to change your whole life for the better is acceptable. A deep and abundant stream flows merrily in quiet, transparent streams, although perhaps in some places the forest obscures it, and the ray of the sun does not shine on it. So this most sacred divine prayer, when attracted by the spiritual goodness of our heart, makes its saving establishment in it, then joyfully and uncontrollably flows here as a deep stream of heavenly joy about God our Savior, full of peace and holy bliss, quiet, invisible, to bodily eyes, but it is palpable to the heart of a person who has accepted this great and most sacred action. Chapter 6 About the Fruits of Prayer Question. What are the fruits of prayer? Answer. They are indicated by the Apostle, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Galatians 5.22. This is true, but I would like to hear closer instructions from your personal experience on this subject. The Elder. When prayer by the grace of God makes a home in our heart and thereby unites us with the Lord, we will immediately notice that it powerfully stops the flow of unclean thoughts. And this, of course, is in accordance with the gospel legend that when the bleeding woman touched the Lord Jesus, there was a hundred flows of blood from her, Mark 5.29. So here, as soon as our mind touches the Lord Jesus in his most holy name, immediately the fermentation of vain thoughts and the uncontrollable swiftness of the mind stops, which, as everyone knows from experience, confuses the ascetic most of all. The Jesus prayer places in the heart unspeakable love for God and neighbor, or rather she is the very being of love, its strength, property, and quality. She burns the whole heart with the fire of God, transforming the natural fatness into spiritual nature, according to the word of the scripture, our God is a fire consuming all that is unclean and sinful, Hebrews 12.29. For such a person, the greatest misfortune in this life is if uh, he has to, willingly or unwillingly, insult his neighbor. Until then, he will not find peace in his soul until he really pacifies his brother of uh, his will by all means of his power. And indeed, you need to know more than anything else and more deeply establish in yourself this inevitably necessary and apt absolutely irreplaceable truth, which lawfully follows from the entire teaching of Christ, Colossians 3.14. For love is the essence of the gospel law. Without knowing this, you can work a lot, but all this will be useless, like uh, sewing on a stone. That is, you need to maintain sincere love for everyone without exception. This is the most important condition for acquiring the gift of prayer. The exercise of the Jesus prayer separates a person from everything earthly, and this is necessarily required by the very essence of prayer, which according to the teachings of the fathers there is alienation from the visible world, rejection of the cares and every thought and clinging to God. So at this time I really wouldn't even want to think about anything related to this life, and we would by no means wish, if it were possible, to ever cease from the work of prayer for his sake. The most obvious sign of the fruit of prayer felt um, more than others is precisely the feeling of eternal life heard by the heart in the divine name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. In addition, the Jesus prayer, having established itself in a person, opens his mind to a deep, extensive, and accurate understanding of the Holy Scriptures, and this action necessarily comes from the union of our spirit with the Spirit of Christ, or his divinity, and in the Lord, as is known from Scripture, Scripture, all the treasures of wisdom and understanding are hidden, Colossians 2.3. And he is the God of the nations and the Lord, 1 Samuel 2-3, through 3, gives wisdom and from his presence knowledge and understanding, Proverbs 2.6. With him is wisdom and power, with him is counsel and understanding, Job 12.13. And besides this action of hers is also consistent with the narrative of the Holy Gospel. When the Lord Jesus Christ, after his rising from the dead appeared to his disciples with his doors closed for fear of the Jews, he assured them of his resurrection, and at the same time opened their 
minds to understand the scriptures, Luke 24, 45. From here comes the knowledge of the mysteries of God announced in Revelation. This is what the Apostle Paul desires to Ephesians, that the God of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him with an enlightened heart. Ephesians 1, 17, uh, 20. Feeding on prayer and, if possible, trying to remain in it for as long as possible. Sometimes I actually taste the joy of heaven ascending in spirit to the heavenly world, as if at a royal meal, resting in the inscrutable silence of the grace-filled breath of the Holy Spirit. Oh, how at this time I want to repeat the divine words of our hero. Confess to the Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you hid this from the wise and prudent and revealed it to babes. Father, that you were well pleased. Matthew 11:25. It is difficult to imagine that our and what greatness is given to a person, but he is not delusional and does not have the slightest concern about it. In the highest living, the Almighty Lord, terrible in power and endless in mercy, has his resting place in him, sits in his heart as if in a temple, incomprehensible, mysterious, but nevertheless significant and tangible. Here, by the way, it would not be superfluous to recall the enthusiastic words of St. Simeon the New Theologian relating to this state. St. Simeon the Theologian says, What tongue will utter, what mind will speak? It's scary, truly scary, and more than words. I see light that is not in the world. I see in the middle of the cell, sitting on a bed, I see the creator of the world within myself. And I talk, and I love, and listen, sweetly feeding on the one vision of God, and uniting with him. I surpass the heavens, and this is, I know, I and is known and true. Where is the body here? We don't know. And, O oh Lord, he continues, he loves me so much and in himself accepts me and hides me in his arms, is alive in heaven and is in my heart and is seen by me here and here. Indeed, the human race has been awarded unspeakable heights and honor in its life on earth in that Christ the Lord offers us heavenly bliss, which consists precisely in communion with him, saying, You will abide in me and I in you, John 15, 4. But we can be in him only through, power, through prayer, uniting our mind and heart with his most holy name, in which he himself is present with his most holy being, and also says, He who is in me and I in him will produce much fruit fruit, for without me you can do nothing. John 15, 4 through 5. Why? Because in the words of Metropolitan Philaret of Moscow, the only source of goodness and strength is God. In order to draw the forces of good from this only source, a person must be in communion with God, and in order to achieve communion and blissful union with God, for this you need to direct your mind, will, and heart to Him. What exactly is the essence of prayer, which will give strength to fulfill the entire Christian law? It seems that staying in the Jesus prayer includes the fulfillment of all the commandments and all the teachings of the gospel, since the mind and heart abiding in God become alien to everything earthly and completely inaccessible to even a single sinful thought. The enemy, the devil, has no opportunity to even approach that person, and not just to implant a bad thought, the divine power of the name of Jesus burns him like an unbearable flame. Not being able to start himself, he arms people with hatred, and therefore prayer books, for the most part, as noted, are persecuted and hated. Chapter 7 what is required in order to be capable of acquiring the gift of the Jesus Prayer, or what is the same living communion with the hypostatic Word of God, Jesus Christ, in whom is the life of everything living and life-giving light to all people? Answer, first of all, you need to believe that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the true God, is the very promised Savior of the world, whom humanity has been waiting for throughout its existence on earth, as its Savior and Reconciler, and about whom it was said in paradise to our sinful first parents, the seed of the woman will erase the head of the serpent, Genesis 3.15. 
then it is necessary to fulfill everything that the Lord Jesus Christ commanded us to do in his holy gospel, either directly or through his holy disciples and apostles. In a word, we must fulfill everything that the Christian law teaches us, our faith, the Orthodox and Holy Church, founded on the foundation of the prophets and apostles, is the cornerstone of Jesus Christ himself, Ephesians 2.20. It is necessary, of course, to begin with proper preparation for the reception of the holy life-giving mystery the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the sacrament of the Eucharist. Without this, according to the word of the Lord himself, we cannot have eternal life within us. Uh, this most holy sacrament absolutely cannot be replaced by anything. It is divine, limitless, and eternal. In its fruits for us and in its power and everything that is human is imperfect and sinful. In general, one must lead a repentant life in deeds and works of piety and good deeds to diligently rush to accomplish every good deed no matter what we encounter on the path of our life at the same time it is still necessary to pray for the granting of this priceless gift the jesus prayer to the most blessed mother of god and the zealous intercessor of christians the queen of heaven and earth one must firmly know and be undoubtedly confident in the immutable truth that as the most chosen of the entire human race the most honorable cherub and the most glorious without comparison seraph the purest solar lordship the ever-Virgin Mother of Christ our Lord, worthy to be for the sake of her incomparable qualities, the matter of the Son of God, first born from the Father. Then at the same time she was given the grace to give this prayer to those people who ask her for this heavenly gift, as can be seen from the lives of many holy saints of God. For example, Saint Seraphim of Sarov, Saint Parthenius of Kiev, Saint Maxim of Mount Athos, and others. There Therefore, if someone turns to the Mother of God with heartfelt faith and earnestly asks for the gift of prayer, he will receive it without restriction, and it serves as an undoubted guarantee of God's great mercy towards us. This divine and sacred prayer, terrible for all creation and fiery for demons, must necessarily rest and rest on four pillars. Firstly, on sincere humility. You need to ask the Lord God for the gift of seeing yourself as the worst of all creation, considering every person without exception as your best. Treat him in a friendly, sincere, frank manner without any flattery, deceit, or pretense. Secondly, on love for every brother, unfeigned, completely, even to the point of laying down your soul for him. You need to love him as yourself. What you wish for yourself, do it for him, or even so as to give him his most necessary things, in a word, to lay down your life for everyone close to you. Thirdly, it is necessary to keep yourself in purity of mind and body. Here, of course, is the impurity of prodigal passion in all its forms and manifestations, starting from thoughts and heartfelt sensations to passionate touches. You need to know that this heavenly world cannot remain in a fetid vessel, but will tear it apart and pour out. The fourth pillar of doing the Jesus prayer intelligently is to have a heart of pain and sad contrition for your sins and for your great sinful damage. This last work is so necessary that, as everyone knows, St. John Climacus says, no matter what great feats we undergo, if we do not have a painful heart, then they are all vain and useless. In addition to all this, you need great and extraordinary zeal and diligence in the matter, an unspeakable effort, and most importantly and most necessary, the help of God. But even with all this, sometimes several decades pass before a person enters the boundaries of the Jesus prayer. Why is it so difficult? Because there is nothing equal to it at its highest levels, uh, where all our true spiritual life generally goes and acts as those who have been worthy by the grace of God to achieve this high state know well. Moreover, this is uh, one of the highest means for combating opposing forces. As Climacus says, beat the invisible adversaries in the name of Jesus. You will not find anything stronger than this weapon. It is said that in the name of God is God himself. 
himself, but to gain God is not easy. And again, the elder grieved deeply that now the practice of the Jesus prayer is almost unknown to the people of this age. And continuing his speech, he said that the impoverishment of the Jesus prayer mainly stems from the fact that there are no mentors and teachers for this soul-saving work. Not only is it extremely poor, but as Bishop Ignatius says, they are not there. Indeed, the sad time has come uh, for us, which was foreshadowed from afar by our spiritually dear fathers who lived immaterially in the mountains and deserts, and many in the midst of the world, in cities and villages, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, enlightened with grace, becoming great and receiving glory, both were on earth and especially in heaven. They said that the time would come when materiality would suppress the spiritual, earthly pursuits would prevail, and spiritual ones would be relegated to the background. And if the teaching about this saving prayer, by the mercy of God, had not been included in Scripture, then even traces of it would now have disappeared. Then I asked, How does psalmody relate to the Jesus prayer, and is it necessary? The elder answered, It depends on the degree of spiritual development in whom the spiritual sense has perceived the Lord himself, in whom, according to the words of the apostle, all the treasures of wisdom, reason, and knowledge are hidden. Colossians 2, 3. The reading of Psalms, Canons, Akathis, and Troparians become difficult, and perhaps even more so, uh, part and unnecessary because he, directly standing before the face of God with his mind and his heart, cannot divert his attention for a single moment from the sweetest Jesus. That is, everything is the old law and serves as an accusatory guide, is a mentor and teacher to Christ, having only according to the word of St. Thomas the Apostle, one shadow of the future blessings hidden in Christ, as it is said about this in the rite of the Divine Liturgy. Or at the fulfillment of the law and the prophets O Christ, and as the apostle says the end of the law is christ romans 10:4. in addition this can also be seen in the lives of the holy saints of god who have achieved perfection thus saint isaac of syria says that he knew one ascetic who said about himself i can still read one glory the psalter but that's next although i will stand for a long time i no longer have the need for verbal prayers and this of course is due to the rapture of his mind into the spiritual world Likewise, in the instructions of the fathers, everyone who is trying only to acquire the Jesus prayer and does not yet have it is advised to read a lot of psalms and songs, canons and traparia, and that is all until his mental powers, little by little, gather into one, come to the state of immobility and non-parity necessary for union with Christ. After this, the law no longer applies to him. The Holy Spirit himself guides him in the work of prayer. I dared to ask, Tell me, Father, in what form and order do you do the Jesus prayer? The elder answered boldly, Only in the words, Lord Jesus Christ, and then, as we weaken, I add, Son of God, when I am in an ordinary state or even distracted, then I say the full Jesus prayer, the divine words of which are so sweet, kind, and pleasant to me that I absolutely cannot tear my heart away from them for a single moment. I hear that they are putting the divine into my spirit soul and uh, like a spring of many waters pour the water of life into me in other matters i will say that these three divine verbs in the name of uh, trinity constitutes my primary day and night service to the lord god predominating over all other spiritual activities that's why you don't read any prayers I read the provisions of the prayers to, of the church at appropriate times, but they do not constitute such strong food and drink for my heart as the name, Jesus Christ, for I clearly see that this all-creating and all-powerful name serves as the root and foundation for all prayer. Of course, the Holy Apostle also says, Praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit at all times, Ephesians 6, 18. And the Holy Fathers prayed various prayers prescribed for the faithful of the Church. But when they achieve perfection and divine unity, then of necessity they abandon the diversity of prayer, for their spiritual powers were united into one point, and incomprehensibly and individually united with the one and only Jesus, in whom alone, in whom fact uh, there always was and is the light and life of man, John 1, 4. 
And besides, in the book of the Holy Fathers, Callistus and Ignatius Xanthopoulos, in the 50th chapter, it is said about this that those who have succeeded and achieved perfection cannot say the entire prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, but they say only two words, Lord Jesus, or Jesus Christ, or Christ the Son of God, or even just one word, Jesus. They embrace it and kiss it like the full act of prayer, and through this alone, they are filled with inexpressible sweetness and joy that surpasses all mind and hearing. It is known that every finite being is something unified in itself, despite the multiplicity of its properties and sides. The higher and more perfect a being is, the more its multiplicity is subjugated to unity. The all-perfect being is the purest unity without any multiplicity, and our soul, as created in the image of God, must come into the unity of all its powers, properties, and abilities from the spiritual journal. And most of all, internal prayer to our Lord Jesus Christ contributes to this, as ascetics experienced in this matter know this well. The essence of this prayer is precisely the collection of the mind and all its thoughts from all the ends of the earth and their conclusion in the heart. The center of our being, in which the production of prayer takes place, connecting us with the Lord. Of course, there may be doubt, they say, what kind of prayer is this? Only three words. And besides, he does not consider it necessary to read all the other prayers in which almost all true Orthodox Christians practice. But thanks be to the Almighty Omniscient Lord. He inspired his servants, our wise mentors, the Reverend Fathers, who lived righteously and holy in their time and they moved by the Holy Spirit, did not leave a single moment of the highest spiritual life that they would not give a full explanation of. So this state is described in the book of the above-mentioned saints, uh, Fathers Ignatius and Callistus Xanthopoulos. They say that such a prayer serves as evidence of the remission of sins to the spiritual person in whom it is affected. For his soul, having risen into the vision of God, united with the Lord, and abides in him, being alien to every thought, even in the fullness of the spiritual, for the Lord our God is above every word, image, thought, and reason. Callista and Ignatius Xanthopoulos, chapter 48. Here it will not be superfluous to explain the word fusion, often used by the Holy Fathers, in the spiritual teaching about the Jesus prayer. The word fusion, or as St. Macarius the Great says, the co-dissolution of our spirit with the spirit of Christ, that is, his divinity, must be understood not in such a way that the independence of our soul or its consciousness is lost, plunging into the divinity like a drop in the sea and doing one thing merging into the unity of the divine nature no this is impossible but in such a way that the whole soul gathering together in a heartfelt feeling with all its powers thoughts feelings desires and sensations is penetrated in this collected unity by christ's co-presence just as a ray of the sun penetrates glass this is nothing more than the inner coexistence of jesus christ in our heart Heart, when we hear within ourselves his words, his presence, and even, so to speak, his breath, and we are one spirit with him. But despite all this, a person recognizes himself as a completely separate person. His personality and independence are by no means lost, and his freedom is not suppressed. But only his soul, in all its strength, necessarily ascends to the level of a higher being, blissful, which is the designated goal for every rational being, angel and man. Well, what about the gospel? It is related to the Jesus prayer, but it receives all its power, incomparable significance, priority, importance over all other books, and a powerful effect on human hearts from the name of Jesus Christ more than any other name. So if you take this name away from the gospel, then it will be like any ordinary book of the mind, human. Anyone who wants to bring the Jesus prayer into his soul must read the Holy Gospel as often as possible, and as often as possible until it is all in his memory. This is absolutely necessary, because there is one Spirit in the Gospel. And in the name of Jesus Christ, this, says the Elder, I have experienced many times in practice, in hours of coldness, laziness, and negligence. In order to awaken a slumbering spirit to activity, I always draw strength from the Gospel. As soon as I read one chapter, my spirit receives revitalization and the strength it needs to move in its activities. It is even quite palpable 
palpable and audible to the senses how divine power is poured out in the name of Jesus Christ, often repeated in the gospel, and the deed itself sees the fulfillment of the words of the Lord, I am the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me, even if he dies, he will live, John 11:25. In addition, the gospel most powerfully contributes to the revelation in the heart of love for the Lord Jesus Christ, because it alone, and only one thing, initially introduces us to the Lord, conveys his saving teaching, tells about his suffering, death, and resurrection, talks about the miracles of Christ which no one else could do, and the name Jesus shines in the gospel which the light of the divine, like the sun in its power, and indeed it is a book of all books as a product of the infinite mind and the all or what is the same the Jesus prayer is absolutely necessary to read the Holy Gospel which has illuminated the entire universe with the light of the purest knowledge of God as often as possible and so the name of Jesus Christ constitutes the root and foundation the center and inner strength of the gospel serves as the cornerstone for him as it is said the stone is Christ 1 Corinthians 10 4 the gospel serves as a necessary means for for us to acquire in our hearts the sweetest Jesus, in whom is eternal life and the kingdom of heaven. Question. You said that with difficulty, or at least not with the consciousness of the first importance, duty and necessity, you read all the prayers. Um, the fathers, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, compiled and taught by the Holy Church for the universal use of all Christians, while it is also written about Abba Philemon that he read the entire Psalter orally every night and conceived one from the Gospel and another from the Apostle. Answer, I do not despise the elder answer, the establishment of the church, and I consider it essential and necessarily inevitable to fulfill everything that is taught and commanded by our child-loving mother, the church, for the eternal salvation of, his, of her brethren. But you just need to know that in the spiritual life, and especially in our prayerful march to the Lord God, there are inevitable measures and degrees of approach. For the first time, as soon as a person renounces the world by his will, in order to serve the Lord God by fulfilling his holy commandments then the variety of church prayers psalms canons and troparians is absolutely necessary for him because his mind cannot yet have composure and unification in a single point which happens upon reaching perfection and then as he penetrates into spirituality or rather as he unites with the spirit he increasingly enters into unity and finally unites with the name of God into inseparable in individuality. We know a person about Christ, the elder added, in our generation and in our time living, who said about himself, in the whole spiritual and material world, I see only two words, Jesus Christ. The heartfelt union of one's spirit with the Lord, this state is achieved, one might say, not by manly, um, not by many, especially in the present time, which is generally sparse in such aspirations. It is known that man has fallen away from the Lord God with many vain thoughts, for the scripture says, God created upright man, that is, with a single unwavering desire for the supreme good, and sought the thoughts of many, Ecclesiastes 7.29. From here the primitive state of innocence of the first people becomes somewhat clear to us, that is, when even now we see all the need and necessity of subordinating the lower forces of the soul to the higher principle of spirit, which is called the dominant mind. And as St. Gregory the Theologian says, he was the, uh, was the first to be struck by sin, desiring equality with God and filling himself with these sinful thoughts. Bishop Theophon writes about this, the natural relationship of the constituent parts of a person should be, according to the law of subordination of the smaller to the larger, the weaker to the stronger, as follows, the body must be subordinate to the soul, the soul to the spirit, and the spirit by its nature must be immersed in God. Man must abide in God with all his being and consciousness. Moreover, the power of the spirit over the soul depends on the divinity inherent in it, the power of the soul over the body on the spirit that possesses it.
After falling away from God, confusion occurs and was bound to occur in the entire composition of man. The spirit, having moved away from God, lost its strength and submitted to the soul. The soul, unexalted by the spirit, submitted to the body. Man, with his whole being and consciousness, was mired in sensuality. A person, before accepting new life in the Lord Jesus Christ, is precisely in this state of a degraded relationship between the constituent parts of his being, the likeness of which is represented by a telescope, when its constituent parts are pushed into one another. Thus the word of God, speaking about sinners who forget God, almost always calls them carnal, rarely spiritual, but not only does not call them spiritual, it even considers them the opposite of such. Even about the first antediluvian world, God said, My spirit shall not dwell in these men, for they are flesh. Genesis 6.3 And as for Abba Philemon, who performed the entire Psalter every night, then it must be said about this, Not everyone has everything. Everyone has their own talent, but we need to look at the inclination of our hearts, where it finds its spiritual food and drink. What does the Apostle say about disturbing various gifts of grace to people according to their experience? acceptability. To everyone, he says, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the benefit, to one the word of wisdom, to another the word of reason, to another faith, to another the gift of healing about the same Spirit, to another the action of powers, to another prophecy, to another spiritual reasoning, to one the birth of tongues, and to another the speaking of tongues. But all this the operations in are one and the same, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. You see the difference in the gifts of grace and unequal giving of God to each his own, that the Lord himself, the knower of the heart, finds it necessary for the benefit of him and his neighbors. And in another place the same apostle says, Let us go to the struggle that is set before us, Hebrews 12, 1, that is, to whom which belongs one for torment, another for the monastery, for the feet of obedience, one for the desert, and one for the military fight with adversaries. Everyone has their own calling, but the essence of all exploits is purity of heart and love. Without these, no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12:14 which in a simple concept must be understood as moral perfection or success in virtue. And the elder extended his speech about the extreme necessity of love in the matter of salvation, and his speech flowed like a high-water river full of spiritual intelligence, but behind many words it is impossible to convey everything, only it was clearly visible that without sincere love for our neighbor our entire life is vain and insignificant. I asked, What is your rule? The elder answered, Living in the desert and performing every service for myself and taking care of everything necessary for life, I am not able to fulfill a certain rule. In addition, the action of the inner Jesus prayer, often by the mercy of God awakening in my heart, does not allow me to fulfill the rule. I don't fulfill it by performing the action of the Jesus prayer. I find justification for such an act in the teachings of the just-mentioned Holy Father, Reverend Philemon, instructing his disciples to do the inner Jesus prayer. He says, if day or night you feel the influx or inner spiritual power, then do not heed your rule. This would mean leaving the highest and descending to the lower, or leaving the talk with the Lord face to face, and uh, to leave the house and extend your conversation to him through the wall, which incongruity, of course, is obvious to everyone. But how did Anthony the Great stand at the appointed hours giving honor to prayer? And he, as the founder and leader, needed to show the entire monastic family the order and order of his life. Otherwise, what will happen when the newcomer lives without rules? I think that is not necessary for those who have achieved the Jesus prayer. I find evidence of this in the book of the previously mentioned fathers Ignatius and Callistus. They saw that they... Um, they say that we need reading, bowing, various supplications, and prayers until we achieve pure prayer. Having achieve, uh, received it, everything remains below, and a person prays only the Jesus prayer, not being able to replace it with anything else at any time and during any activity, day or night. Even during sleep, his soul does not cease from prayer, but rests in it as if the light of the face of God. 
Here I am, the elder continued. I know many hermits who have brotherly love for me and the Lord living here in the mountains between the passes where not even a hunter's foot goes due to the distance and extreme difficulty of the path. They told me that all their service to God day and night consists only of these three most divine verbs, Lord Jesus Christ, 